chilling tales for dark nights. A Promise Lasts Forever by David James Narrated by Otis Gyre Produced and original score by Jesse Cornett It's been a long time since I traveled down this old road. Hell, it's been a long time since I even came home at all. I knew I'd have to one day, though. I've known this day would come for a long time. After all, I'd promised I'd do this, and I've been many things in my day, but a liar is not one of them. I can still remember going up and down this road on my bike as a child with all my friends. We'd ride to the river that was only a few miles away and spend the entire day laughing, swimming, and just cutting up for the most part. Just before sunset, we'd usually flag someone down and hitch a ride home. Things were different then. You could stop a stranger in a pickup, throw your bike in the back, and he'd take you as far as you needed to go, so long as it was on the way or wherever he was headed. Actually, this road runs through most of the town, so no matter where you were going, it was probably on a person's way. Like I said, though, Times were different back then, simpler and more innocent. And then one day, they just weren't. I guess it's funny how change sneaks up on you that way, ain't it? I'll never forget the last day we all made that trip together. It started out as just a beautiful day as you could imagine. The sun came out early and as soon as it did, the neighborhood kids started gathering down at the cul-de-sac. That was sort of our meeting place where we would wait for everyone to show up and see who wanted to head out toward the river. None of us in this little town were what you would call wealthy, so our entertainment was what we made it, and that river was pretty much our playground. Just as he always had before, my little brother Kevin begged and pleaded with me to take him with us that morning, but as usual, I told him no. There was no way he'd be able to make the ride, and even if he did, I wasn't going to watch him the whole time we were there. I argued with him for a little while, but when it was done, I got my things together, grabbed a bite to eat, and headed down to the circle to catch up with everyone. The whole gang was already there, and even a few more kids from the adjoining neighborhood that I didn't know. We sat around and poked fun at each other for a bit until eventually someone asked if we were going to gossip like little girls all day or get going already. The few girls that already were there didn't take offense. People just didn't get offended over little stuff like that back then. Instead, they agreed by poking fun at the boys too, and soon after we hit the road. It was a hot ride, and the sun was beating down hard. Passing pasture after pasture, we climbed one hill and coasted down the next trying to catch a breeze and cool down. We jumped over the occasional driveway here and there on our bikes and raced from one road sign to the next, mostly to show off in front of the girls. Eventually, we finally made it to the entire five miles down that old country road. Just up ahead, we could see the river, the water reflecting the sun's rays in the distance. As we approached it, everybody pulled off toward a little dirt trail that veered away from the road and wound under the bridge. Once you got down below the bridge, it was mostly sand, so you couldn't ride anymore. Instead, it was better to park your bike underneath so nobody could see it from above. After all, you never knew who was passing by, and you didn't want to get one of your bikes stolen or let the county sheriff know what you were doing either. The space under the bridge was a real sight for young eyes. There was graffiti everywhere, and some of the drawings were pretty well done. There were messages about people we knew, their older siblings, and even their parents from long ago. You could see beer bottles scattered about and fishing lines tangled on the old posts while listening to the sound of vehicles crossing above from time to time. Occasionally, we would act as if we knew exactly what kind of car was passing by, 
and even sometimes whose it was, too. To any adult, that place was probably just a mess, far better off left alone. But to us? Well, to us, it was a whole new world, where even an empty beer bottle was worth picking up and giving a look. I had managed to stock my tackle box quite well with all the old lures I found dangling about as well. After hiding our bikes well underneath and taking a moment to snack on whatever people had brought along, we made our way toward the river. The water was a little too rapid under the bridge, but there was a place not too far away where it was just right. Following the trail, you'd enter a small patch of woods, and the river snaked around a few times. After a short trek, you'd come to a good clearing and a sandy beach that was quite secluded, and far enough from the road that you could still hear it without being seen yourself. This was our spot, and was probably the spot for many before us as well. You could relax on the sand or step right down into an area deep and calm enough to be safe. Just across the river was an old rock where a tree had grown outward and reached over the water. And the limbs stretched almost far enough out to hit dead center, too. On one of the larger ones was an old rope swing that had been there for as long as anyone could remember. We used to joke that the rope swing was probably there before the river itself and that they had just built the river around it. The day unfolded just like any other before. We swung into the water again and again, trying to see who could make the biggest splash. Everybody got dunked at least once, some more than others and there were a few shorts and tops which were briefly lost but quickly recovered. As happened every time, someone told the girls there was a snake in the water next to them, and they screamed and jumped <laughs> as usual. The days were pretty much the same when we came down here, but that was just fine by us. We had a great time. As the sun passed overhead and the hours flew by, little by little the crowd began to thin out. We were still kids, and some of us had to be home at a specific time, whether it was to go somewhere with our folks or just check in. It must have been around 6.30 when the last of us began making our way back to the bridge to grab our bikes and start heading home. When we did get there, we sat around for a moment and finished the rest of our snacks, discussing things like who could stay underwater the longest. It was while we were eating that one of the girls, Cindy to be specific, pointed out some graffiti on the far underside of the bridge. Stained in a dark, almost maroon shade of red was written, R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning. Cindy began to read it out loud, but one of the boys interrupted her immediately. I wouldn't do that if I were you, or else Clyde Manning's going to come for you. Everyone got quiet. Uh, okay. Who the hell is Clyde Manning? She asked with a roll of her eyes. Apparently, she didn't know, but everybody else sure did. You see, stories like that don't die in a small town, no matter how old they may be. And even though you didn't hear a lot of talk about it, the story of Clyde Manning was common knowledge around these parts. Cindy was new, though, and had only lived here a few years, so it made sense that she didn't know. We all gathered around and took turns telling whatever parts of the story we had heard. Clyde Manning, or Killer Clyde as everybody had called him, had lived not too far from here about 30 or 40 years ago. He had been an odd man from what I had heard, and judging by the old photos I had seen, not the friendliest looking fellow either. I would seen his picture before, and from it, I knew that he had medium length red wavy hair, and freckles scattered about his cheeks. His face appeared to be sunken in, and his body was tall and lanky. He looked bony, almost like one of those girls you'd see in a magazine who hadn't eaten for years. Clyde had lived in an old shed right outside of his parents' farm and kept mostly to himself. Sometimes he would drive around town in an old pickup truck that belonged to his pa. Clyde had worked at a neighboring farm a few miles down the road, and occasionally people would see him walking back and forth in the morning, going to and from work on the days he didn't have the truck. To this day, folks still tell tales of how creepy he looked, just strolling down the old road. Around the time Clyde was working that farm, people began to go missing. 
Sometimes it would be somebody's wife that appeared to have left an abandoned car on the side of the road with a flat tire. Other times it could be a stranger that was just passing through town. Either way, people just disappeared. And always seemed to be on that same road when they did. There was a brief investigation regarding each missing person, but in those days you couldn't do much without a body. As far as the police knew, these folks could have just up and left on their own. Heck, who knew if the so-called passers-by were even here at all? One night, though, all that changed, and they began taking the claims seriously. The sheriff's son had been on his way to a girlfriend's house when something must have happened to his car. It was found abandoned about a mile before her house by one of the county deputies. Usually, that wouldn't be of concern to anyone, but with all the recent excitement and rumors of missing people, there was a search party formed immediately. They combed the woods, looked down by the river, checked with all of his friends, but there was nothing. Nobody had any idea where he was. After knocking on doors and asking whoever answered if they'd seen anything at all, a common story began to unfold. Although nobody had seen the sheriff's son, they had all seen Clyde Manning riding up and down that road. After hearing that more than a few times, you can believe that it didn't take long before the police began to wonder if just maybe this supposed killer they'd been investigating had actually been right here all along. All the police rushed down to the Manning farm and surrounded the home. Clyde Manning, come out with your hands up! Come on out, Banging Clyde. on the doors, they began shouting that they were there for Clyde and to send him out immediately. His parents came outside to see what the police needed Clyde for, but they claimed to have no idea where he was. The police had all assumed he lived in the main house with his parents, but he didn't. He had been staying in that little shed out back for a long time. When Clyde saw all the police surrounding the farm from his shed out back, he crept out to his father's truck and was able to escape unnoticed. He jumped in the old pickup and began his getaway. But that drew attention, though. The police could see that old truck barreling down the drive with a cloud of dust surrounding it that could probably have been seen from a mile away. It was probably only a minute or two before there were six or seven cruisers right on his tail. The police were all around Clyde as they began pushing and bumping the truck, trying to force it from the road. Clyde made it about a mile or so, trying to fend off the convoy of cruisers around him, before he came up on the bridge. Now this bridge isn't a big one, and it's hard enough for two cars to cross it at the same time, much less have seven or eight of them playing derby on it. Who knows if he realized it or not, but old Clyde's truck never stood a chance of making it over that bridge. Somewhere about midway across, one of the deputies came ramming into the side of his truck. And the impact was about the last one that old Uncle Metal could take. The left front tire buckled beneath the frame, and as soon as it did, the truck began uncontrollably weaving back and forth. It collided with the left wall of the bridge, then shot back across the right side, hitting it with even more force, smashing against the side walls with an extreme amount of force. Clyde blew two more tires and ripped the front panel right off the vehicle. As it grinded up against the side and skidded further down the old bridge, a piece of steel sticking out of the bridge railing snapped the front bumper of Clyde's truck. It didn't bend the railing a bit, and it didn't let go of the truck, either. The steel jerked the truck one final time into the wall and swung it around in a clockwise motion. The truck exploded through the wall and flew into the air before dropping down and smashing under the rocks below. When the police finally got down there, it was a horrific scene. The truck was crushed, parts of the cab were already on fire, and most people were rubbernecking from a distance in case it exploded. Despite everything, though, Clyde was still alive inside. 
They could hear him somewhere in that mess screaming in agony as the flames just got hotter and hotter. Nobody knew what to do. They just stood there as if each man was waiting for the next to do something. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, to the shock of everyone, Clyde came crawling out of an opening underneath the cab. Jaws dropped as the crowd witnessed Clyde emerge from a pile of steel and flames. They all assumed he couldn't get out, but there he was. His face had been cut up on one side and his arms were horribly burned. Blood dripped profusely from the side of his head and he lurched and staggered as he tried to stand up. When he did, he began mumbling something as he approached the officers who were still standing there, gaping in both amazement and fear. Before he could reach them, though, one of the officers drew his gun and fired, hitting Clyde Square in the chest. As soon as he did, every officer followed suit. When it was all over, Clyde lay there on the riverbank with 40-something bullets in him, as dead as dead can be. The way the story goes, one of the officers went over to check his body and make sure he was dead, and in doing so, got Clyde's blood all over his hands. He went to wash it off in the river, but just before he did, the officer stuck out his blood-soaked hands and wrote, R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning, on the bridge in Clyde's own blood. Somewhere beneath that spray paint writing over there and a few other layers of different colors that had been rewritten through the years is the original writing in Clyde's blood. The thing is, after Clyde was gone, the disappearances didn't stop. They were less frequent, but every few years or so, someone would go missing, and they were always reported as being last seen around here. Every now and then, people would even claim to see old Clyde's truck leaving the area where the missing person was last seen. People would whisper that if you went down to the river and started talking about Clyde, and maybe even read the writing on the bridge, he just might come for you. After we finished telling the story to Cindy, it got all quiet. We all sat there for what was probably just a minute or two, but felt like much longer. It was as if everyone was waiting to see who had the guts to speak first. Eventually, Cindy stood up and began laughing hysterically. Are you guys serious? I mean, don't tell me you're afraid of a ghost story, are you? Killer Clyde Manning? She chuckled in sarcasm. She continued laughing and walking over towards the writing on the bridge, but the rest of us just sat there. Nobody was going to admit it, but we were afraid. Cindy wasn't from here, though, and she wasn't going to subscribe to any legends we had to tell. She reached up, placed her palm right on the writing. R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning. R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning. R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning. R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning, she said over and over, laughing and mocking us for being cowards. She kept on and on until finally one of the boys said that it was time to be heading home. When he said that, we all found our voice again and just shrugged off Cindy's taunts as being dumb and immature. Gathering our bikes from the sand, we began pushing them out from underneath the bridge and followed each other back toward the road. Cindy, still snickering, eventually followed as well. Just like any other time... We began pushing our bikes back instead of riding them. When we would come to the river, we would be full of energy and excitement to get here. But usually by the time we left, we were pretty much just tired. It was the two boys out front that first flagged down someone and asked for a ride home. A nice older lady I didn't know pulled off to see what they were waving at her for. It only took a minute before she agreed to take them back home. She had said she was traveling to the local general store anyhow, and didn't much mind giving them a ride. Next, two more of us, a boy and a girl, were able to get a ride from someone that was delivering a trailer full of hay. He told them that he'd give them a ride, as long as they didn't mind sitting in the back with the hay. 
They didn't mind. They preferred it, actually. And just like that, they were gone as well. At the beginning of the day, there must have been yeah, about 20 of us, but now our ranks had dwindled down to three. It was just me, Cindy, and Tommy, who lived just a couple doors down from me. Cindy suggested we flag down a car, too, but Tommy and I thought maybe we'd want to race up another hill before we did. Eventually, we all agreed that we'd do one more race, all three of us, and then flag down a ride when we were done. Soon after reaching this consensus, the race began. We took off quickly, and I passed Tommy within a few seconds. Cindy and I were next to each other, going back and forth, as one of us would get ahead for a few seconds, only to go glance back and see the other closing the gap again. Pedaling as quickly as we could, we got closer and closer to the sign on top of the hill. Eventually, I pulled ahead for the last time. It took everything I had, but there was no way I was going to let a girl beat me. I'd never hear the end of that one. I stopped on top of the hill, and she caught up shortly thereafter. We both rested to try and catch our breath. In the distance, you could see the road as it began to flatten out for a couple of miles ahead. There wasn't much to look at except for empty pastures. Even most of the cows had retired to their barns for the night by now. Behind us, I saw Tommy, who was off to the side trying to fix something on his bike. Looks like his chain popped off, Cindy said. She was right. From what I could see, he looked to be trying to get it back on as he pushed slowly, holding the side of the cranks. Glancing down the road ahead, I could see there wasn't anyone coming, so I told Cindy just to wait there, and I'd go help Tommy. When we both got back, we could try our luck finding someone to give us a lift. I coasted back down to meet Tommy. He was still tugging on the chain and cursing up a storm as if the sheer force of his frustration could somehow make it pop back on. We spent a few minutes working at it together before we finally got it back in place and started making our way towards Cindy again. From what we could tell, she was still up there waiting for a car to pass by. Just then, Tommy pointed something out. Cindy was walking up the road as if someone was approaching. We both stopped, cupping our eyes to try and see through the glare, and as we paused a minute, we could see somebody pull up. She's not going to leave us, is she? Tommy shouted as we both began rushing toward the top of the hill. We were almost there when we saw something that made us both stop dead in our tracks. We watched motionless as an old gray truck pulled up to Cindy and stopped in the center of the road. Cindy looked into the truck and just stood still. Even from our position down the road, we both noticed the look of pure horror that spread across her face. The driver's side door opened and out stepped a tall, red-headed, deathly-looking man. As he rose out of the cab, a wide grin exposed his rotten teeth. He walked over to Cindy, and as he did, she began screaming at the top of her lungs. We could see her kicking and punching, but it was no use. The man grabbed her and lifted her up over his head like she weighed nothing. After holding her there for a moment, still kicking and screaming, he slammed her into the bed of his truck. When he did, you could hear her body pound hard onto the steel floor, and the sound echoed through the valley. As soon as the echo disappeared, the yelling stopped. It became completely silent. As we stood there watching, too terrified to move an inch, the man crossed back in front of his truck and looked straight at us. <laughs> he laughed for a moment. Then he got into his driver's side again and began to turn the truck around. Suddenly, I found the courage to move again. Gesturing frantically, I shouted at my friend, Tommy, it's Clyde Manning. Tommy and I both jumped on our bikes, pedaled as fast as we could towards the truck, which had already completed a three-point turn and was preparing to head its way back, that it came. We were quick, I mean quicker than we had ever been, and we must have gotten to the top of the hill only 30 or 45 seconds after he pulled away to the other side. When we reached the summit, though, and peered over the other side, there was nothing. You could see for miles down the road, and there was just nothing. No Cindy, no truck, nothing. It was as if he had just disappeared. We spent that night down at the sheriff's office, carefully retelling every single thing that happened that day in as much detail as we could recall, 
right down to the exact species of tree we'd peed on by the river. They took it all down, but refused to believe that we saw what we said we saw, or at least who we said we saw. We both begged and pleaded them to believe us. We knew Cindy could still be alive out there somewhere. Still, all they said was that they'd look for a man that matched that description. They just refused to believe that we really saw Clyde Manning. Our parents were the same way. They believed we saw something. They even believed we saw someone take Cindy. But they theorized that it could have been some older boyfriend she'd been hiding from her parents or something. People even went so far as to recommend that since she was 14 years old, a little older than us, she might have run away with this guy and that they could be together hiding out. That theory stuck for a while, too, but one thing was for sure. Cindy was never seen again. Years went by, and eventually most of us grew up and went out into the world to start our own lives. From time to time, there would be a new disappearance around here, but it was always the same old story. No body, no suspect, and it seemed no willingness to admit that any crime ever even happened at all. I was in my third year of college when I came home to visit that summer, and I had mostly convinced myself to forget what had happened all those years ago. I was attending school halfway across the country, and didn't make it back very often, so returning home felt nice. Pulling into my old neighborhood was almost refreshing. As usual, I knew Mom would have prepared a big dinner, and the whole family would be there to greet me when I walked in. That's pretty much how it went, too. We ate a huge meal, sat around for hours, talking about what everybody had been doing. Tommy, as it turned out, had opened a pretty successful restaurant about three towns over, and my parents had even been there a few times. My father had just recently hit his last year of work and was looking forward to finally retiring. My mother, on the other hand, was concerned Dad was going to be real bored, real fast, just sitting at home all day. Even my brother Kevin was grown up by now. He was in his senior year of high school and not really sure what he wanted to do next. He'd been dating a girl from school for a while now, and for the most part, his plans were just to be with her as often as possible. I didn't know her, but I knew the family. Her older brother and I played ball together when we were kids. I spent about two weeks relaxing around the house and helping with a few things that my dad wasn't able to do anymore, until eventually it was time for me to head back to school. I had signed up for a summer course, and it was going to start in a few days, so I wanted to get back in time to get resettled. Saying goodnight to everyone, I headed up to Kevin's room so that we could talk just a little bit more before I left. I didn't get to speak to him much these days, with both of us being so busy and all. When I got to his room, though, nobody was in it. I looked over towards the window and could see it had been left slightly open as if he needed to get back in later. It didn't bother me at first. After all, I snuck out plenty of times when I was a kid, too. If it hadn't been for his notebook, I would never even given the scene a second look at all. I noticed his notebook from school sitting on the floor in front of his bed. The front of it was labeled World History, and I began nosily flipping through it. The pages weren't schoolwork, though. They were love letters. I knew he had a few classes with his girlfriend and that they sat next to each other in class. I figured this was probably what they used to pass notes to one another, all while appearing as if they were actually studying. I laughed a little at first, reading it. It was stuff about how much they loved one another and how they would get married one day. As I curiously flipped through the notebook, you could even see how their relationship had progressed. The letters became a little more personal and private. At that point, I decided it was no longer my business to read. I figured I'd put it back, but before I did, I wanted to see the most recent writing they had exchanged. Kevin got out of school a little later in the year than I did, so most of the recent writing was from just a few days ago. It talked about how she was going to be leaving town for a few weeks with her family, and how much she was going to miss him. He responded by telling her how much he wanted to spend time with her before she left. Eventually, they made plans to meet up with one another, but as soon as I saw the exact nature of their plans, my heart stopped. The plans they were making were for tonight, and my heart seemed to stop as I read that their arranged tryst was set to take place under the bridge. I read further as I saw the two of them joking about the story of Clyde Manning, 
and daring one another to test it. Kevin mentioned how I had freaked out when I was young and claimed to have seen Killer Clyde. I felt this feeling inside my body as if the room temperature had just dropped to below zero. My head began pounding. My hair felt as if it was standing up on end and I was frozen in fear. That memory from all those years ago consumed me from within, and all of a sudden I was a child again. I looked over at the window and noticed his car wasn't in the driveway. Maybe I can go get to them before it's too late, I thought to myself. I had no idea how long ago he had left, but I know that I had to go find him and I had to go now. I ran to the kitchen and grabbed my keys. Rushing toward the front door, I passed by my father's office and thought of his pistol. He had always kept it there for protection, and I couldn't think of a situation in which protection might be more important than the one in the middle of which my brother and his girlfriend had placed themselves. Pulling every drawer out of the desk, I eventually found it. The gun had already been loaded, so I tucked it into the back side of my belt, ran to my car, backed out of the driveway, and headed in the direction of the bridge. On my way there, I tried to figure out what I was going to do when I got there. I began wondering if Clyde would even come, and I even began questioning if I really had just been crazy all those years ago. I could recall being told that I may have thought those things because I experienced such a traumatic event. What if they were right? What if I was crazy then, and what if I'm being crazy now, too? It didn't matter, though, I told myself. The only thing that mattered was that I got there as quickly as I possibly could and did whatever I could do to make sure Kevin and his girlfriend were safe. Speeding over the hills, I counted them as I drew closer and closer to the bridge. It had been years since I traveled down this way, but I remembered every hill, every mailbox, everything. Cresting the final hill, all of my nightmares abruptly came terrifying reality. There was the old bridge, and there was Kevin, and pulling up beside him in the center of the road was the same old beat-up truck I had seen when I was a child. I must have been driving 100 miles per hour as I approached that bridge. Just before I reached it, I slammed on the brakes close to where Kevin and his girlfriend were standing on the side. The truck was only five or six feet away. I reached beneath my car seat to grab the baseball bat I stashed there for protection and jumped out of my car. Just as I rose to my feet on the road, Clyde stepped out of his truck, too. I ran up toward them as fast as I could with my eyes locked on Clyde, who was now making his way around the front of his truck. I was yelling at Kevin and his girlfriend to run, but they just stood there in that state of frozen fear paralysis I remembered so well. Clyde and I both reached them at the same time. Get away from him! I shouted as I extended the bat behind my back preparing to swing. I'm warning you, Clyde. Get back! Clyde just looked at me, though, and grinned wide from ear to ear. When he did, some of the old wounds on his face began to tear open, and a little blood oozed out of them. His attention was on me now. He stepped right in front of me and threw his arms out wide, inviting my challenge. I saw the burn scars covering them, and his motion blew a breeze with the scent of rotting flesh into my face. It was all I could do not to vomit. I wasn't afraid, though. I let out a loud roar and swung the bat at him with every single muscle I ever knew I had. (laughs) Instead of connecting with him, though, the bat flew right through his body. It felt like I was swinging through heavy fog. The energy from swinging so hard and connecting with nothing caused me to fall forward towards him. Instead of actually falling into him, though, I fell right through his body and crashed up against the side of his truck. When I hit the truck, it took me a moment to come to. When I did, I swung at him again and again and again until I was completely out of breath. Just like that very first time, though, my weapon went right through him and he stood there undeterred, laughing at me. When I could swing the bat no more, he reached out with his decomposing arms and grabbed me by the throat. I felt his entire hand wrap around my neck as his claws dug into the back of my skin. I felt helpless in his grasp. He lifted me up about three feet off the ground and pulled me forward, so closely that our noses almost touched one another. I could see the bone from his skull through an open tear on his face. 
I noticed something moving inside the gashes as if maggots were actively feeding on his flesh. In his eyes, I could see my own reflections as I remained helplessly dangling midair in his grip. Clyde gritted his teeth at me and snarled with saliva bubbling from his mouth until he began to speak. I'm not here for you, boy. You didn't call me. And with that, he tossed me 15 feet down the bridge as if I weighed nothing at all. My brother and his girlfriend suddenly found their voices again and began to scream. Clyde reached out towards my brother and lifted him above his head, just like he had done to Cindy all those years ago. He slammed him down into the truck and instantly Kevin was silenced. Just then, I remembered the gun that was now poking into my back as I lay on the ground on top of it. I staggered to my feet, still hurting badly from the fall, and pointed that pistol at Clyde. I'm going to send you back to hell where you belong, Clyde Manning, if I have to drag you down there myself. Do you hear me? Look at me, Clyde. I'm going to kill you, I promise. Clyde just laughed. I could do nothing at all to him, and he knew it. I shouted at him as loudly and as vehemently as I could, but he just ignored me. He passed by Kevin's girlfriend and started making his way back to the driver's door. Before he could get in, though, I emptied the entire clip into him. Yelling and screaming, I watched as every single bullet passed right through him just as the bat had a moment ago. It was futile. It did nothing. Before I could even try to understand how this was all possible, he was back behind the wheel of his truck, which then took off down the road. It was over. It was gone again, and now, so was my brother. The rest of that night was a nightmare's deja vu of what had happened so many years ago. The police that had come when I was a young man were now long gone, but the new ones were pretty much the same. They interviewed us both, Kevin's girlfriend and I. They took our statements and, for the most part, didn't believe a word we said. We spent the next few weeks being interrogated and fending off accusations that we had something to do with my brother's disappearance. As time passed, though, even the investigating of us ceased. The general feeling seemed to be, as if I could almost have predicted, as simple as no body, no case. Over the years that followed, I watched my parents struggle with the loss of their youngest son. Occasionally, I could see it in their eyes that they desperately wanted to believe my story, but it was simply too much to comprehend. I didn't blame them for that, though. After all, who could readily believe such a story? I heard that the girl my brother loved so much all those years had been able to cope with it all. Eventually, she ended up in a psychiatric hospital only to take her own life a few years later. Sometimes I wonder whose ending was worse, hers or Kevin's. The years passed, and from time to time I would occasionally hear a new report about someone else who had gone missing, but there were never any leads and never any bodies. I witnessed my mother and father grow old and pass away without ever finding the answers they desperately needed to make peace with their tragic loss. Not long after they passed, I left this old town for good. It wasn't easy hiding what I had known to be true all along, but in life, we all do what we have to do to move on. We don't have much of a choice. I settled down about 250 miles away, got married, and raised a few children of my own. The time spent raising my own family was the greatest time of my life, and I was almost able to forget about what had happened on that road so many years ago. Almost. You see, I made a promise the night Kevin was taken, and that's why I'm here today. That's why I'm walking down this long road, and that's why I'm finally standing here in front of this old bridge that I haven't seen in a very long time. Almost 50 years have passed since that day Clyde and I last met, and I never forgot the promise I made to him. I lived a good, long life with few regrets. But three days ago, in a hospital room surrounded by my loved ones, I finally passed away as well. My physical life on this earth has ended now, and finally Clyde and I are on the same plane. The way I see it, 
It's due time I make good on that promise. I honestly have no idea why I couldn't fight back that night all those years ago. Why his being dead allowed him to touch the living, while the living were rendered powerless to touch him. I suppose it doesn't really matter now, though. Now that I'm dead, too, I can grab that evil son of a bitch. And I'm going to send him straight to hell. Just like I promised him I would. Laying my hand upon the writing on the bridge, I closed my eyes and screamed at the top of my lungs. R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning. R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning. R.I.P. Killer Clyde Manning. Come on, you evil bastard. I definitely call you this time, didn't I? Let's finish this. And with that, I stepped into the middle of the road, raising my hands high into the air and grinning from ear to ear, as I watched a familiar old beat-up truck appear in the distance, driving down the road toward me.